Hello, everyone out there in the Facebook world. We are here live for our next Power Hour with Power Players with uh, Kevin Kaufman here from Group 4610 in Arizona. So what's up, Kevin? What's going on? How are you doing? I'm doing really well. We're super excited to have you here on our show as our next guest. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is something that we started um, about six, seven months ago. Just our contribution back to the real estate world, even entrepreneurs, just people looking to grow business. So if you like what you see here today, we've got a Facebook group. You can go to tghtpowerhour.com and ask to join that group. It is a private group right now. Um, and we're just constantly having some of the top minds in the business, top entrepreneurs, just sharing content in there. You can see more videos from here. Um, and it's just a great place for, for y'all to help, you know, learn to, to grow your business and talk with other like-minded people. Um, do me a favor. As we start to go through this, Kevin is just a major badass in what he does. And he's going to be telling us everything that he has done up until this point to grow his business and what he foresees for the future. So if y'all have any questions or comments, please go ahead and make them. We are, um, I'm able to actively see these. So I'll make sure that Kevin's aware of them. Um, if you're watching with us live, put like a, a capital L in there. And if you're watching on replay, put an R and that way we know. So Kevin, um, let's get started. I, I'm super excited because you guys, you and Fred specifically have been mentors to Nick and I before you probably even knew that y'all were mentors to us. Um, we've been watching your business for, for the past few years and then you and I've gotten a lot closer. You've been a mentor, a coach, we've become friends. And, um, so I'm super excited to have someone like you in my life and, and on this show. So tell people a little bit, you know, of a background, what you did before you got into real estate. Oh, I always like to say I worked for the devil, um, which means I worked in for a bank. Uh, so before real estate, I was mostly in the finance world. So I got a job when I was 20 um, as like a credit card collector and that, which was really honestly, like it was sales because it was so soft, what they would call soft collections. It was really a sales job. I just didn't realize it at the time. And I did that for like six months and then got like this accepted into this program for this company and um, kind of part, kept just parlaying my experience into jobs I didn't deserve uh, for a long period of time. And, and I uh, had, had kind of run the gamut on that until I uh, decided that I could no longer work for the man. And I was going back to school full time, trying to figure out what I was going to be when I grew up. And, uh, and then sure enough, I discovered real estate during that kind of during that journey of going back to school full time. And I ultimately, um, once I realized it was real estate, I sort of dropped everything and, and jumped full, full bore into that. And that was uh, 2007. Oh, what a what a great time in the market to to want to jump into real estate. So when you found it, when you started getting in, was it still good and the market about to go down or were we already going down? <laughs> so in Arizona, it was already going down. Like it was so bad. I had friends like try to talk me out of doing it. Like it, I mean, it was pretty bad here. Um, so and I don't think Texas was too dissimilar. Uh, but the Phoenix market was definitely like prices were going down. And for the most part, by then, everybody had realized, uh oh, something bad is happening. And I guess everybody but me. I was going to say, so what in you said, sure, let me run in when everyone else is running out. Solid idea. Uh, the truth is, I just decided it didn't matter. Um, I wasn't smart enough to know that the um, market doesn't dictate whether or not you can make money. It just dictates your strategy. I did. I wasn't smart enough to know that. But what but what I am really good at is pretty much doing the opposite of what everybody else does. And so I, it just didn't matter to, I don't know. I just, truthfully, I didn't take it into consideration. It didn't matter to me. I was going to go do it and kind of follow what I wanted to do no matter what. That's really awesome. So you get in and what, what's it like when you first get in, how do you get started? I mean, that's the main thing so many agents struggle with and you're in, maybe you don't even realize how tough it is during that kind of market to, to get started because you don't know any better. So yeah, definitely. Like? This was an ignorance is bliss type of scenario for me. And I see it as like uh, most people saw it. And I think people even felt sorry for me. Um, but I saw it as like actually an advantage, not a disadvantage uh, for my future growth. And so honestly, what I did is I learned as much as I could. Now, on a, you know, I didn't really have any direction. I didn't have any, 
any really direct mentors like in the business. I didn't have a coach or anything like that. Um, I just, but what I did have is I had ample opportunity to learn. And so I can remember like my first eh, eight months or so, I felt, now this is an exaggeration, but it felt like I was in a class four days a week for anywhere from one to three hours. And that was mostly at like our, our local brokerage. Um, I would either be taking classes that the broker taught, or I would be taking classes that one of the other agents were teaching. Uh, I was just trying to absorb everything because I was honestly, I was scared. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I was trying to figure it out to be quite frank with you. And so I didn't know what else to do other than learn and take what little action I knew how to take. And so I just kept taking that action over and over and over again. And eventually, you know, you start to get your footing and it takes a while. It does take a while. And, you know, luckily for you, you didn't become the forever student that I see some real estate agents become. Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I get it though. There's so much content. So I'm glad that you took that and you implemented it. So, I mean, we're talking 2007. So your main strategy at that time was short sales, right? If I'm correct. Well, I wouldn't, again, like, I'm not sure that I'm smart enough to give myself credit for make, making that a strategy uh, as much as it was just an opportunity I ran into. And so I sold the house. Luckily, my very best friend uh, had been waiting for me to get a license to buy a house. <laughs> and so I, I had I had that transaction under my under my belt. And then I had another one that was like a referral. And then another one that was like a referral from my like past coworkers. I started to realize like a theme here. And then uh, my now business partner, Fred, comes to me and he needs some help with these things called the short sales. I, I literally didn't know what a short sale was. <laughs> and truthfully, he didn't really know either. And he actually had said to me when he was telling me about these listings he had that he needed help with, he, he actually said, I'm not even sure if the bank will, who would pay us to, for doing these, like if the bank will even pay us or not. And I'm like, what the hell? I need something to do, so let's do it. So <laughs> I, I think my third transaction, my third actual sale, um, so maybe I did third or fourth, whatever, was a short sale. It was actually one of Fred's listings that he was gone on his honeymoon and out of the country. And uh, he tricked me, I always say he tricked me into doing all the dirty work for him. But he listed the home, I co-listed it with him. And then I took the offers and I went to the bank and negotiated it, not knowing what the hell I was doing and closed the deal, to be honest. And then I was like, oh, okay, I could do that. And luckily nobody else really wanted to. Yeah. You know what? We see that in our market too. We have a few people who really specialize in it because a lot of people don't want to, and it's a, it's a very different process, but that's so, I mean, that's a big testament to, to you, your work ethic, and obviously kind of why you are where you are today, because you still saw the opportunity, even if the immediate return of the money wasn't there, Definitely which, wasn't there. which is awesome. Um, you know, quick question I want to ask that I think a lot of the people who end up watching this, because, you know, this is for not only great teams already in businesses, but it's for the single agent too. So for when sure. you even made this jump into real estate and you're not really aware, you are aware people are telling you, hey, it's a, it's a rough market. It's going to be really hard. What did you, how did you come into this financially prepared? I mean, was this, I've oh. got to make money now. There's no nest egg or you want me to be honest with you or do you want me to like tell a feel good story? No, I don't um, like the feel good. Be honest. Yeah. So no, the truth is I wasn't prepared for, again, uh, theme here, noticing a theme, I wasn't prepared <laughs> for it. Uh, I had saved $10,000 and I thought, I, I genuinely thought that'll get me through. Um, <laughs> and I quickly realized it didn't. So the fun part was it was just months before my wedding um, that I'd quit my job like six months before my wedding. And, um, I didn't have the money. Like luckily I had, um, my mom let, lent me some money, not a lot, but she basically lent me another 10,000. So I had $20,000, um, to kind of get started with. And, you know, I guess had I started out with 20,000 savings, that would have been great. I could have done it. Um, I just was in a position where I had already been out of the house for years. I, I owned a home at this time. I was engaged. Mm -hmm. So I get it. I had a lot of responsibilities, just like a lot of people who want to get into real estate have. And um, I say this not to like give myself credit, but I just, it, it didn't matter to me. Like I was just going to make it happen. So I'm definitely one of those like jump in the deep end and then figure out how to swim type of people. Uh, I'm not, a, I have to have it all figured out. I just, I kind of just went for it. 
And it turned out that while I thought I was prepared, I wasn't. And like anything else, I just, I made it work. Like had my mom not lent me the money and it's not like my mom had a lot of money to lend me. Um, she did it cause she believed in me. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, that was, I was very fortunate to borrow that money and I repaid her and as quickly as I can in, in like eight or nine months. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that it didn't matter. Had she not lent me the money, I would have made it work some, more, some other way. Like I would have got rid of my house sooner. I would have got a roommate. I would have, you know, you couldn't go drive for Uber Lyft then, but I would have done some, you know, I'd have done some, I'd have gone on waited tables or sold stuff or whatever. Um, right. It didn't, didn't really matter to me, but yeah, so I wasn't prepared though. I was not prepared. <laughs> I don't know that most people are. So that, that sounds about right to me for, for jumping into this. So you, you help out Fred. He's going on his honeymoon. You're doing some hard work. You're not even sure if you're going to get paid. What makes you continue to work with those short sales? Because you saw the opportunity that no one else was. Yeah, luckily I did get paid. Uh, and so <laughs> that was nice because paychecks are nice. And um I realized that like, I don't know, I just, maybe cause I just had some start coming to me like, cause that's in Phoenix in 2007. So now we're talking about like towards the third quarter, fourth quarter, 2007. I mean, there, there was no traditional market. It was, you either had, if you wanted to list houses, you either had short sales or you had REO accounts or you had homes that didn't sell. And I definitely was not into homes that didn't sell. <laughs> uh, and so I also was not into going back to work for a bank. So I wasn't going to take REOs at the time. And so it was short sales. So I just, I kind of, to be straight with you, I took what came to me. I just lead generated the best I knew how. And that brought me some buyers and it brought me some short sale opportunities. And then um, as we got more focused, as Fred and I started working together, like more formally in uh, early 2008, that's when we started to get focused on generating short sales and just realized like, wow, for sure, nobody else wants to do this. Let's go for it. Because I think we can, we can really get a lot of these and we can figure out how to make, how to make this work and how to make us money. So did you know Fred before he came to you at the market center and said, hey, help me out? Yeah, I recruited him. I didn't even realize I was recruiting him, uh, but I'd known him for years. Like I actually know Fred because he's, him and my wife have known each other since, I don't know, like second or third grade. They went to elementary school together. They went to college together. Uh, they've been really good friends and him and I connected over real estate before I actually got in. He was already a licensed real estate agent. Uh, we had some similar interests. And so we had just started, we'd hung out quite a bit. And so when I got into real estate, um, he was sort of making his way back into real estate from another business he had. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we connected that way and then ended up working together. So how did y'all decide to form that partnership then? Hmm. It was total necessity. Again, not a lot of strategic planning here. Um, <laughs> We knew, so the, the long story is we had a good buddy uh, named Mark who was generating a lot of business, uh, but, and he had a real estate license, but he had a job. He had another sales job and he couldn't, um, he just, he was a lead, he's a great lead generator. He's not a great executor at anything else in the business. And so we just, he was like looking for a referral source. We're like, why wouldn't you just send these to us? Well, that's how a conversation started over a lunch over Mexican food, which is also a theme with Fred and I. <laughs> and, um, so we, we started talking that day, like, why don't we just go sit in an office together? And at the time, his little brother who likes to take credit for starting group 4610, he was kind of working for both of us part time, like just doing little, um, little tasks, you know, like basically uh listing assistant type of task because, um, on an hourly basis. And we said, why don't we just, why don't we see if we can get Brian to work for us full time, 40 hours a week. We'll go, we'll go rent two offices and uh, we'll just see what can happen. Like, let's see if we can help each other. Maybe if we sit in the same room and negotiate short sales, uh, it'll be easier than sitting alone at home because it sucks getting hung up on all the time when you've got no end of venture frustration to. And so that's really how it happened. So we go to our broker uh, OP who owned another, another brokerage and, and that was totally empty and a complete disaster. I think they had like one office rented out or two offices rented out of the 30 or 40 they had. And, um, we just said, Hey, can we just rent office space from you up here? And he said, yeah. So we rented two office spaces. We put his brother in one and we put the two of us in the other. And we kind of went to town we made an agreement on a financial arrangement, what that would look like, um, for anything we already had. And then anything in the future that was generated, we sort of just went to town, not really 
on purpose trying to form a partnership or a business. We were just trying to make some money to be totally straight with you. Sure. We had our backs to the wall, both in massive debt. Um, both had, um, you know, we're both newly married. He got married in July of 07. I was married in October of 07. And so we both had a lot of responsibilities on our shoulders and we were just, we were just trying to make it work. And, um, that was kind of the beginning of it and it blew up really fast. And then we realized, oh man, we, we actually have to, we, we have to formalize this because there's something here. And so that's when we started getting very purposeful about what we were doing. That's really cool to hear. That's really awesome. Um, if you don't mind, I don't think you will, cause I know how open you are. Um, Will you tell people kind of initially um, what y'all did as that financial structure, that compensation structure for how you, if you brought in the business, if he brought in the business, when it was yeah. more of the informal partnership? Yeah, totally. And this is great because now I can just send people to this link because I get this question a lot and people will actually, this is probably the thing people want to talk to me about the most. It feels like the last couple of years um, is we have this agreement that, we we drove to Yuma where I'm from and we had Mexican food at the best Mexican restaurant <laughs> on the planet, chili pepper. And um, we drove there and back and forth to basically have lunch and to talk about what this would look like uh, financially. Cause we were both in situations where we were kind of the ones left holding the bag from our business partners. And mm -hmm. we were both determined to never let that happen again. And so what we had come up with an agreement initially was, hey, if I brought in the business, you know, whoever brought in the business, they received 85% of the income and the other person received 15% of the income and then, um, and vice versa. And if for some reason, because of who we were and what we were doing, brought in business because of the, what we're working together, then we would just split that 50-50. But the most of the income was split 85-15 in favor of whoever generated the lead, but the expenses were split 50-50. So the cost of employing his brother full time, the cost of all the faxes, because at that time we were having to fax all of our short sale packages in, the cost of the office rent, et cetera, that all was split 50-50. So neither, nobody could live off the other person. Like you actually had to pull your own weight and we both wanted it that way. And um, we were very clear, like it was in writing. Um, you know, we came into that quote unquote partnership with like, 11 or 12 listings at the time. And we just, we actually wrote those down. Like, here's what you get paid on this one. Here's what I get paid on this one. Here's what you, you know, each one of those properties. And we just have this document that we emailed to each other back and forth throughout the year, every time we had updated. So, you know, it was 85, 15, and then it was 80, 20 and 75, 25. And we eventually, after about three years, got to 50, 50, because almost everything we were doing was 50, 50. And it was causing our, our administrative staff more work than anything. <laughs> But it, it kept us really competitive. And to this day, like if you log into our system, we track a lot of things. We track a lot, so much. And we're so competitive that we still track if it's if it's from my sphere or his sphere versus anybody else's sphere in the business. Because we want to see at the end of the year who generated the most business. Oh, even totally. Though, even though we split it 50-50 now. I mean, we're not competitive at all, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little. Guys, if you're watching this, I'll have Kevin send me that link um, that he was talking about that now displays this for y'all to actually go and look at um, just so that you can have access to it. So listen that to me and we'll put it in the comments below. Um, okay, so when y'all did unofficially form this partnership, are we still 2007 or are we 2008 yet? 2008. So it's February of 2008, um, February 1st, 2nd, whatever that first Monday was, we walk into this office and um, we bring our files, our paper short sale files, and we kind of start setting up shop and going to town. And um, it was quite the wild ride. You know, we closed 60 transactions that year, which is really my, you know, my first full year, my first full calendar year in real estate. And of those 60, probably 35 to 40 of them closed in the fourth quarter. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So we we're broke as hell. Broke, hashtag broke AF. For sure. <laughs> Um, during that time, like we've got some stories from those days, no doubt about it. And, um, and we just, but we went to town and you know what, it blew up quickly. Like I can remember it felt like we went from those 12 listings to 50 overnight. I mean, it really felt like it was overnight because we started teaching classes. And, um, so people were referring us deals. It was, it was quite the experience. And that's why, that's why, that's another reason why looking back, like it was a total advantage to me to be in a, such a quote unquote crappy market. 
Mm -hmm. It allowed us to build our business um, that we, I don't know that we could have built it that fast in a more traditional market. Yeah, because most people do that in three to six years, assuming, and that's still giving them more credit than probably most deserve. <laughs> um, okay, so when y'all did end up growing really quickly, did you have to add people to your team? So at this point you had Fred's brother, but did we add people then when we went to 30, 40, 50 listings? Yeah, we're and we're, we were really smart about it too. Like we just grabbed whoever was willing to help, friends, family members, etc. Um, you can, I think you know how that goes. Like, you, like it's that that would have been as well as we put the plan into it. And so, you know, our first real hire, I would say it was the first real hire. Her name was Heather. She was actually the MCA of the market center and and had quit her job. She had put in her notice. She was looking for a different opportunity. And she approached us and she said, hey, I, I see what you guys are doing and what you're building here. I think I could be a resource. And so um, it turned out that that worked out. And so we started working together with Heather and she was our first like real hire. And um, she was awesome. She helped start help, uh, helped us start getting systematized and actually building things. So we could focus on what we did at that time was to lead generate, we taught short sales classes, and then to make money, we actually closed short sales, which meant him and I were on phones with banks like 30, 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So um, that was like our first formal move towards, okay, let's go make this a business. I love that though. I love someone like that who saw the opportunity and the vision with you guys and just jumped in also, kind of like yourself, not really knowing where it may officially lead. Yeah, she totally took a chance on us when she, and she, I mean, she approached us and it was kind of like, I was kind of like, are you sure? Like, you, are you sure you want to join this crazy train? And she was like, yeah, I'm in. And so we worked together for a number of years and it was, it was awesome. And, um, and so that was kind of really the first formation of it uh, was, was then like, so that was like middle of 08, mm -hmm. it was July of 08 that she joined us and we, we went to town, we got to work. Is she still with you today or not? She is a designated broker of a, of her own company now uh, in Tempe and she's mm -hmm. awesome. I run into her every once in a while at Starbucks and see each other mm -hmm. online, of course, and stuff. So she, uh, she's doing awesome with her business and uh, you know, she, but she helped us for, gosh, she was with us for two and a half or three and a half years. And it was like really good. Like it was a really good transition for her. It was a really good transition for us. Mm -hmm. She helped us get our footing where we needed it. I think we helped her gain some experience that, that she needed and kind of helped her to where she's going today and it helped us to where we're at today. Love that. Love that. So, okay. So tell me, so it sounds kind of like we, you know, we hired a little bit, like you said, out of necessity. Um, she saw the opportunity. When did it become, okay, we're really, that was your first step to treating it like a business, but when did you mentally make that choice or how did you make that choice of, yes, we want to grow and we want to grow and like get other people in this organization? Like, when did it become this team? Like that's the one thing I think that we really did right is we hired people because we had to, because we had generated so much, like, we just couldn't do anymore. There wasn't enough hours in the day mm -hmm. for us to get everything done. And there wasn't, so that, that's when we started hiring people and neither one of us were willing to get up and go show homes at the time because <laughs> uh, we were too busy on the banks with short sales and fielding calls from homeowners that, so that's what forced us into hiring buyer's agents. And, and, you know, we, we saw that we were really lucky because we taught short sales and we, we gave away all of our content for free for a number of years. Um, we had a lot of introductions to people. So we had some great mentorship from other people and, um, so that was what, you know, that helped us get purposeful about it fairly early. Mm -hmm. Not that we did everything right because we didn't. We screwed up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. but I, like, I remember going to our first recruit select class in August of 2009. So a year and a half in, we're, you know, we're going, okay, we got to be really, we got to get way better at this. Like, what do we got to do? And somebody had told us, uh, hey, you got to go to this class. And sure enough, that, you know, was a good, good step for us. Okay, so now what, what's the market doing? You're still, you're adding buyer's agents, you're doing short sales. Um, how, what, I mean, what does their structure look like? Did you have structure on your team? Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is we look like, it, so if you're familiar with the millionaire real estate agent model, um, 
we looked like that. We looked like that team. Like we had a lead buyer's agent. He had showing assistants. We had, um, you know, a lead listing agent who was on salary. Mm -hmm. We had uh, an administrative staff, transaction coordinator. Like we looked like a millionaire real estate agent team model. The only difference was our listings were short sales. They weren't traditional sales. Mm -hmm. That stayed that way for a number of years from like a model standpoint. And so we just kept growing. We just kept putting in the effort to grow in our business every single year. And, uh, it, you know, we made some changes further on down the road, which we can get into if you'd like to. But after we made some huge mistakes, but like all the way through 2011 and into 2012, like we still even 2012, when the market was shifting um, back to a more traditional market, we were mm -hmm. still mostly doing short sales and, um, and running an MREA model team just with short sales as our listings. And then, um, made a big change in 2000, end of 2012 and into 13 and another big change in 14 that set us up for where we're at today. And even though you have the, the, the lead listing specialist who's salary, you and Fred are still ultimately the rainmakers for the team at this point, right? With your short sales. Yeah, at that point, like we're the rainmakers. We're not listing the properties, but we are handling the up. I'm mostly at this point handling the upfront consultations. Fred is is running the kind of the short sale negotiation department, and um, and then Stephanie, who is actually with us now, she's our uh, one of our number one agents in our company. Uh, she and she's in our Nashville location as a salesperson, um, and she kicks butt with just in the traditional market now in Nashville for us. She was taking all of our listings. So I started slowly training her. I actually hired her in 2009 and um, she just kept working her way up and kept taking more and more responsibility. So by, by the time 2012 rolled around, um, she was taking all of the listings. I wasn't even going on the appointments. I would do the phone consultation. And then once people would start submitting their paperwork, she would take it and run. And I would never basically deal with it again until there was problems where we need to talk to somebody, but I would handle sort of the front end stuff and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. And she ultimately took, took over that job for me too. Um, and, and so I mean, that's, that's what it looked like. So this is what you've known. This is how you built your business. What did you do when the market shifted to a, what's known as a starting to become a great market? Yeah. Um, that was, uh, well, I did a lot of going, what the F am I going to do? So <laughs> There, there's a whole other story in there, which I won't go into, but let's just say I got distracted. Fred got distracted. We left the state of Arizona for a while for another opportunity. Um, so while the market is shifting and we basically get up and leave our business, it's still running, of course, and mm -hmm. we're having our best year ever. And it's also at the same time falling apart. Like Stephanie doesn't really want to do what she's doing anymore. Um, there's conflict with her and one of the other leaders, quote unquote, leaders in the company. And um, we're doing a really poor job of being leaders for this company. And so things start to fall apart and the market's shifting. So by the time we got back in, into, the, uh, into the business towards the end of that year, fourth quarter, 2012, we realized like, crap, we've got a, things look really good right now, but we've got a big problem on our hands and we got to solve this. And um, truthfully, it looked like by the time January 2013 rolled around, Fred and I were the only two salespeople in the company. And... Um, we had to make some serious changes and we basically i i took the role of lead listing agent fred took the role of lead buyer's agent and we started we kind of started over in 2013 and that's the year i like to tell people like that i learned how to be a realtor because i actually had to take listings where i didn't know more than anybody else on the planet like <laughs> you couldn't beat me in a short sale if like if we were competing for the same short sale listing you couldn't beat me nobody could beat me I believe yeah. it. That's how we found about found out about you. That's how we followed you then. Yeah, so. I mean, that's how a lot. It's so funny. That's how a lot of my relationships that I have with people came from that time, and um, and then I so I had to learn how to get listings, and that was like a nice kick in the teeth for about a year. So <laughs> that sucked, and our business went backwards for the first time ever. You know, we'd sold like two hundred nineteen houses in two thousand twelve. Wow. And then in two thousand thirteen, we were like one hundred and thirty. So. And that was, and it sucked because Fred and I were doing all the work. We were basically the only salespeople uh, with the exception of we hired one salaried kind of buyer's agent, but she had other responsibilities too. And um, she's still with us to this day and is one of the top agents in the company, if not the top, uh, you know, the 
five years now this month that she's been with us as a salesperson. We totally started over. Wow. So tell me then about the restructuring of that. So y'all had to figure it out, but I mean, now we're to the point where you're this huge organization. So what, what did it look like when you were rebuilding? So it looked like 2013 rolls around. Um, Fred and I are the agents. We have one amazing transaction coordinator uh, slash administrative extraordinaire. Her name is Sherry. And um, we just sort of go to town. Like we literally cut all lead generation budgets. We That's the thing about 2013 is – so you could go, oh, wow, you, you closed 130 deals. That's great. Yeah, but I'll actually pat myself on the back, not because of that, but because we didn't spend a dime generating leads that year. All oh, wow. we did is follow up on old leads and take referrals. <laughs> like that was it. Didn't spend a dime on new leads. And so we had, um, we had I guess there was one other admin at the time who had stuck around and she really became like a, um, had to do a lot of, you know, wear a lot of different hats. And so... We, I, like I got to getting, learning how to take listings and I learned the hard way, got my butt kicked mostly for the first few months and Fred started closing buyers, thank goodness. And we had still had some short sales that would come in and, you know, we definitely had our unfair share of short sales still because mm -hmm. of just the presence we'd had for so long. Um, and that's, you know, that helped us get by. But the reality was, is I had to, I had to learn how to take listings and that was tough. So 2013, hire a salaried buyer's agent. Um, and she, you know, she, she's awesome. And then we hired another one in 2014 and, um, we start to quote unquote figure out how to run a more traditional business and mm -hmm. it, with listings and buyers and Fred's now moved over and is helping me with listings and by 2014 and we're starting to get our footing right and figure this out. And, um, and then we just go, this sucks though. Like I hate, I hate my business. It's great. It makes a lot of money and I hate my business. This is not the business I want. And so we started asking questions and I started interviewing people, not interviewing, but just like picking brains of like my friends. So like uh, I went to Brett Tanner, who uh, is a friend of mine in this market. And, and we just sat down and I said, Brett, sell me on your model. And he said, what do you mean? I said, tell me about your model because the way your team operates is different than mine. And so he showed it to me and it kind of like blew my mind. I went to Gubernick and I went, to, I asked him the same question. I went to, we went to Ben Kent. Ben Kenny had been a friend of ours for years. And ultimately Ben had invited Fred and I up to spend some time with him in Bellingham and um, got to shadow him, stay at his house, like, like just learn everything we could from Ben over like a three day period. Mm -hmm. And kind of from that, we created this new model, not created. We just sort of combined couple of things that we liked that Ben was doing, a couple of things we liked that Brett and Brian were doing and these other people. And we just decided here's our new model. And so uh, August, September of 2014, we come back and we decide, hey, things are going good, but we hate it. Like I don't like my business. I don't like my job on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we're going to change things. And we, at the time, we had two salaried buyer's agents, which was great for the net percentage bottom mm -hmm. line. And for the company uh, dollar. Yeah. yeah. And not at all scalable. And so what we had to do was we made a big change. And so we started allowing our agents. We, first of all, our two salaried agents became commission only and we helped transition them there. It's not like we cut them off. They, they might feel like they were cut off, but what they might forget is that we still pay them a salary for another 30 days and start paying them commissions on stuff that was already pending to make that like smooth for them. And I started hiring other people. And we just decided our agents were going to be able, we're going to train them how to take listings too. And so we started, we started working our new model and simultaneously um, had expanded into the Denver market. Cause Hey, if we're going to do things different, why not do them way different? <laughs> I love y'all style. Yeah. You just go all in. <laughs> yes. All in. And so Denver, uh, we opened September 1 of 2014 with Aaron Lobovic, who is still our leader, top guy in, in the state of Colorado today. And uh, we went to town and we just started working on building something new with this model, trying to do it there and trying to do it in Phoenix at the same time. And how'd that go? <laughs> I mean, obviously, Denver's still there. Phoenix is still there. So that's good. Yeah, no, it went extremely well. To be honest. I mean, getting started in another market is a challenge. I think we closed one deal that first four months and it was his mm -hmm. mom. <laughs> his mom. 
Um, <laughs> so like anytime somebody bitches to me about a commission split because it's from their sphere, I'm like, Aaron's first deal with his mom. It was his mom. Like, I don't want to hear it. And um, <laughs> so he, um, but 2015 rolls around and we close like seven deals in January. And this is just in Denver. Uh, and six deals the next month and five deals the next month and then 70, like it just now we're rolling, right? Mm -hmm. and so we go from like 160 closings in 2014 to 380 in 2015. Wow. And like, it was a big ride, like a big rocket ship. And at that time, Stephanie Weaver sort of came back into our life from a standpoint of uh, she had moved to Nashville and wanted to get back into real estate. And so we thought we were geniuses because of how well it was going in Denver. So why not expand in Nashville too? Mm -hmm. So we expanded in Nashville and started working there. And um, there you go. It was like kind of off to the races at that point. But you know what I noticed between both of that is you had the who. You had the right person. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You can't do anything without the right person. I mean, you can, but it'll be very short lived. Right, right. And because y'all also knew Aaron before uh, Denver, right? Before he yeah, opened so that we, location. Yeah, we met him. Uh, through short sale team. Well, again, like so many of my really great relationships that I have today, I uh, met through teaching short sales. He ran a different company, a software company that provided um, data to investors and real estate agents on foreclosures and short sale filings. And um, he wanted to sponsor one of our classes that we were teaching in Denver. And we just formed a friendship and stayed in touch. And I did this weird thing that realtors do sometimes where they keep in touch with people and they call people and um, you know, one thing led to another, we don't have the kind of time to really like go into the details of like right. how we got into that, but that's basically what happened. Yeah. So, and y'all are really some of the first doing expansion. I mean, like you mentioned, there's others like, like Google, Gubernick and Tanner, we've got Ben Kenny, of course. Um, there's a few others in our company who, who are doing this. And of course, elsewhere outside of just Keller Williams, because this isn't just like a big Keller Williams rah-rah uh, pitch or anything like that. But, you know, y'all are one of the first ones to do it successfully and you're opening multiple locations pretty quickly compared to most. So, I mean, is that now um, where where y'all are growing as an organization is continuing to do more, more locations and expanding across the U.S.? No, um, really not. I mean, are we gonna continue to expand? Yes. Um, is that our strategy? No. The strategy is to get as deep as we can in every location that we're in currently. Okay. Um, and when the right, like when the next Aaron Lebovic shows up or the right or the next Mike Turnquist, who is our leader in uh, San Luis Obispo County, when he shows up, you know what I mean? So when those people show up, that's when we go. That's when we'll go again. Sure. But the, tr the truth is, is uh, we did expand too fast, just like just like everybody else, because we thought our systems were better than they really are. We learned a lot and it, I'm not uh, like upset about that at all. We learned a lot from the mistakes that we made and we've shut a few locations down like everybody else has. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we've done is we've just taken our lumps, we've taken our lessons and go, but how can we make what we do have better by, by utilizing what we've learned? And so we've learned a whole lot. And even when we were opening a lot of locations, what seemed like very quickly, um, I mean, and we still have quite a few locations open. The, the It was never about can we open this many locations. It's always been about how many people can we get into business with. So what's our agent count? What's the production of those agents? Things like that. How can we support them? Those are the questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, it's never been about can I have 100 locations or 500 locations. It's more like can we have 500 agents? I love that. You're, you actually are the one who opened our mind to that because I think uh, with expansion, it's really being pitched as, you know, open a lot of locations and people don't expect to go deep. People don't expect you to have more than or they're saying it's a success with X amount of volume or units there. But you're talking about going deep, which is from a business perspective, you totally shifted my mindset on this as far as insulating yourself to as a business um, so that you can always make sure you're in business regardless of who you're in business with, which was a huge mind uh, mindset shift you had with me in 2017. Yeah. Um, and so seeing that y'all are doing them in locations too, I think is, is pretty cool. And that you can essentially, you're recreating your hub everywhere you go and there's no reason that your expansion doesn't have to be 
as successful, as productive as the hub location there in Arizona. Yeah, exactly. So that, I mean, the hub, is, so we, and I mean, you're using, you're using words that people I think give different definitions to. So like for us, our salespeople mm-hmm. uh, like, are in one office, our hub. So all of our support staff is in another office and, um, and that's the way that works. And so, um, we do, yeah, we want to go deeper, like like I would call it, you know, the Tempe market, right, or the okay. Tempe market center for us, as opposed to the hub. Okay. The hub is the place where the back end operations happen in my gotcha. world, and so we don't, you know, but yes, like the overall theme, yeah, we want to go deeper everywhere we're at. We want to be able to have, as you know, last year in Denver or in Colorado last year, um, it was basically sixty million dollars in real estate, right? I want to do that everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was basically that in Phoenix as well. And so like, I, I want Phoenix to do significantly more than that. Um, I want Denver to do more than that. I want Tucson and Yuma and San Luis Obispo. I want everywhere to get as deep, Nashville, every, everywhere to get as deep as we can. So that way they're all producing 30, 40, 50, $60 million, whatever they can, mm-hmm. right, as deep as we can go in those locations, um, as opposed to doing that type of volume spread out over, you know, 27 different cities or whatever. Okay. So, and now you guys are in the expansion game. We're growing this. What does your structure structure look like? Especially now that it's more of a traditional model compared to, I'm sure short sales are still a part of your business um, in some capacity, but what's the structure look like for your sales team, for your agents? Yeah. So essentially there's like a local leader. Um, we've, I, I'm not going to use titles because I feel like we always change the meaning of titles and, and things like that. And everyone's got a different meaning. So essentially there's leaders in every location that, um, well, maybe not every single location, but there's a leader, there's, there's a salesperson responsible. There's obviously salespeople who are there and they work with buyers and sellers and, and all of our agents are empowered to work with both. Um, not all of them get listing leads. Uh, however, uh, the more the more experienced ones do, and everyone's allowed to go generate their own listing leads as well, and we fully encourage that. Then there's people in a leadership role who have some sort of combination of some personal production and recruiting, and it's tough to do both. Like it's really hard to do both. It takes a special person to do both. Um, it takes a Joe Ubre in Nashville or or Aaron Lebovic in in Denver, uh, or you know Mike Turnquist in San Luis Obispo County. It takes a lot. We've We've played around with our model quite a bit. We've had people who purely just recruited and then we'd run into production problems with those people mm-hmm. where we wouldn't have that problem with people who were only recruiting other people uh, in production while they were also in production. And so we've really tinkered around with it because the reality is you don't know. Like I remember sitting in a room with Gary Keller, this was 2015, 2000, no, 2016 probably in this very small mastermind group he has of expansion agents. And he said to me, he's like, hey, don't fall in love with your model. It's going to change quite a bit over the next five, six, seven years. And what you need to do is you need to find the right people to be in business with and worry about that. Don't worry about your model. And he's right. Like that has come true over and over again. That has been a central theme that the model is going to shift. It's Mm -hmm. going to change. It's going to evolve. Like You're not going to get it right right out the gate. So don't think that you are. Like don't fall in love with your model so hard you can't see the holes in it. We've certainly seen the holes in it, and we've tried to adjust when we can and adapt when we can, and and we're still doing that in real time. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. You once again have actually been someone who helped me with that, with that too. So, um, tell me, what is your day to day like now? So you're not in production anymore, and haven't been, um, right? Yeah, so I really haven't been in production for a number of years, for about. Five years, four and a half, five years. I don't know, a while. Uh, I I took a listing a couple years ago, two and a half years ago. I think out of pride because I wanted to prove to some people how easy it was. Um, It was dumb. But (laughs) it was easy. It took me like four hours of my time um, to to sell a house and, you know, make generate nine grand. So that was awesome. And um, I think I did it because people just don't believe me that it can be easy and that you can make people work on your own schedule. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm my today. So real time, like what is this? April 12th, 2018. Um, my day to day looks like, uh, I, I am the local leader in the Tempe office and for Arizona. 
Uh, we've had some transition here in, in Arizona. We've had some house cleaning to do. We had to get rid of some people uh, and get out of business with some people uh, who weren't a great fit for us. And um, we are, so I'm like literally the team leader, if you will, or the rainmaker. And mm-hmm. so I spend part of my day recruiting. I spend part of my day um, uh, working with our agents, you know, kind of helping them reviewing contracts before they send them out. Just, you know, practicing scripts is something I strongly believe in. I still spend a little bit of my day running the business. Like Fred doesn't lion share that, but it's our business. We make decisions together. So I still have responsibilities there. And so I, I spend a lot of my time, you know, over those things. And the, so as you can tell, I'm like really spread out. Sorry, mm-hmm. my computer's on top of my paper calendar. Um, so I've started using like this win by noon um, paper calendar uh, to make sure I'm hitting all my things. Like I'm sending, I'm sending out handwritten notes to my sphere and to the people I care about and referral partners and things like that every day. So I do that as well. To cl- that includes clients, other agents, other referral partners, et cetera, because so, I'm generating business, whether I'm generating leads or I'm generating leads for talent. I'm still doing right. that on a daily basis. So, I mean, that's really what my time looks like. And, I think uh, that's so cool to hear because I think a lot of people are like, yes, I'm out of production. I'm done lead generating, but that's no, always no, a part gotta, of it, you right? step on the gas pedal of lead generation if you come out of production. Right. We're all just glorified, you Isaac. <laughs> you got to be better at it. Like people want to, I think one of the bigger mistakes I see these teams make is that they want to just go and outsource their success. Like, like bad news, an ISA is not going to do it as well as you do. Mm-hmm. Like if you're an agent, I hope you realize that. Like you're not going to just go hire an ISA and they're going to be as awesome as you are. And now you get to go work part time. No. Now you need to focus your efforts even more in your 20%. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that I spend time, my time doing is what's on my calendar is my 20%. And awesome. by the way, what's on my calendar is what I do. Like that's, that's, I think that's the thing where people go, I'm having problems with time management. You're not having problems with time management. People don't have problems with time management. They have problems following through with their commitments. They don't follow through with the commitment they made with themselves in their calendar. And they have all these really great reasons for doing it. As you can tell, I'm like mildly passionate about this. Um, They have all these really great reasons as to why they don't show up to scripts and to why they can't lead generate and to why they had to schedule an appointment at 930 in the morning instead of making lead gen calls. Like they're committed to their mediocrity instead of being committed to their success and committed to their calendar. And, and so when you step out of production, you actually need to go to a different level of accountability with yourself and with your calendar and with what matters most in your business. Oh my gosh. I love everything you just said. If no one else watches the rest of this podcast or webinar, listen to this part. I wish I <laughs> timed what part this happened in. Cause I knew that if we talked amazing. for an hour, I would get at least 30, 40 seconds of like really good content <laughs> out there. Like I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> this is all for 30 or 40 seconds. <laughs> Story of my life, and I won't even make the next joke. So let's <laughs> move on. Oh, God. Okay, so we actually, we only have a few minutes left, but I had a few people reach out to me and ask me some questions that they wanted to hear from a high performer like you. So cool. one of those was, they want to know what your mindset is around bl- breaking through plateaus and how you how you do that. Yeah. So one thing that I always learned and I kind of default to this when I'm when I realize I'm at a plateau, uh, number one is is uh, being real with yourself. So you realize you're at a plateau. Um, and then number two is like Gary Keller said to me a long time ago, you're, when you're at a plateau, you're you're probably missing a relationship. And I start asking myself the question, like, what relationship am I missing here? Is it an accountability relationship? Is it a skill set relationship? Is it somebody like I do I need to learn something new here? What is it I need to add? Uh, who do I need to learn from? And here's the thing about plateaus. It typically means we need to be behaving differently. And so sometimes that, not sometimes, usually that takes an outside set of eyes to tell us how we're behaving uh, and what we need to be behaving differently, how we how we should consider behaving differently. Love that. Spot on. The other thing that someone asked is, um, they want to know what your work-life balance looks like and, and kind of what your mindset is behind work-life balance. Well, balance is bullshit. Like <laughs> there's no such thing as balance. Like 
you want to, if you would like to make money, and trust me, I am not like a Gary Vaynerchuk work 24 hours a day. That's stupid too. Like I love a lot of what Gary V says. I hate I that. I love, I love I, him. I love him too, but I hate that message because that's cheating with time and you don't have time. Your family will not, your fam you can't get back to the time with your family. You can't get back time with your friends. You can't get back time with yourself once you've spent it. And so then you've got to look at it as something you invest or spend. And so work life balance to me is bullshit. What you, you got to understand, like somebody said to me yesterday, he looked at it as like a rubber band, which is like, okay, when I need to go to the next level, uh, I'm going to, I need to, I'm going to stretch my rubber band quite a bit and then it's going to come back. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so I do so, like I've got some non-negotiables in my life and that and that has to do with like the time that I spend at home and um, and the amount of time I'm willing to work. And so what that requires me to do is while I'm working to do what my calendar tells me to do because I have non-negotiables. OK, I I I agree. I love what you said about the the Gary V too. Like we said, he's our boy, but you challenged me to that this past year with you can't you're cheating with time. So I think that's so important for people to to consider at least. Everyone's gonna have their own opinion, but I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I guess I would look at it this way. So um, this isn't like hopefully it doesn't seem like sexist or anything, but like I, I would look at like females, okay? Because I'll look at some agents who are moms and they are very much present for their kids and they run massive businesses, which tells me that they're not working 20 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that means like working 20 hours a day isn't the only way to success. And they're, they're having success. Some of the ones I know, especially that I'm close with, um, and I'm sure you would know them by the name if I said their name, like they also have a great family life. Mm -hmm. And then I look at some other people, male or female, that they work 15 hours a day or 20 hours a day, six or seven days a week. Like, don't get me wrong. Like you can do that in the short run and that shit will catch up with you. It, it can cost you your health. It can cost you key relationships and it, it, like it can cost you your mental sanity. Like, like it's just not worth it to work that much. And so I don't recommend that people work that much. Like okay. I think you can work. We need to all put in the work. It's funny because there's a balance. Everyone wants to be like Grant Cardone or, Gary Vee, or they like want to work three hours a day. <laughs> I think I know both of those people. <laughs> so do I. They're all, they're, and they're all real estate agents. It's funny. <laughs> okay. Kevin, tell us what, what's in y'all's future. What do you see for the rest of 2018? What's in y'all's future for 2019? Yeah. Uh, so in our future, uh, continued growth, continued depth. Um, I'm really excited about, some of the changes we've made within our company from like a structure, organizational structure and what we offer to our agents. Um, so I think we'll continue to shake things up and we'll continue to grow, um, to grow our production and grow our people and grow more leaders. That's part of it. I'm really excited. Fred and I have a focused effort on providing more content and education for other agents. Um, we focus so hard on bringing that to our own folks and uh, we're still doing that, but now we've got more help doing that. And so we'll continue to, to push out as much good content as we can. Um, as you know, you're a member of, of our Facebook group, Next Level Agents. Mm -hmm. a big event coming up. Like that, that's a lot of fun for us because um, it allows us to grow and stretch in other ways too. And so that's part of what we're doing as well. And just looking to, here's the deal. Here's the thing I believe. Now this could be like a cheesy statement, but I believe we're, I believe that we are paid in direct portion to the value that we bring to the world. And so if that's true, if I want more money, I need to find a way to bring more value. And so that's like Fred and I really sit around and challenge, not sit around, we, but I mean, we, we challenge ourselves on the value that we're bringing and how we can bring more value, uh, both inside of group 4610 and outside. That's so powerful. You know, he's, he's actually pretty humble here. If I, he didn't say his numbers and I didn't say it, just so y'all know before, before we end up popping off here. Them and their organization killed it in 2017. So they did over 550 sides, transactions. 552 deals. About 552 for 150 million in volume? Yeah, te technically it's 149.9, but who's counting? <laughs> love it, love it. Okay, so you, you just kind of very subtly mentioned 
uh, next level agents and and the event y'all have coming up here in May. So go ahead and tell our audience here how like how they can support you, what you have coming up, and how they can get more involved in your world. Yeah, awesome. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I had the crazy idea to start a Facebook group to bring value to, to realtors. And uh, because I, I didn't like what I saw out there in that space, and I just saw it as an opportunity. So myself and Fred and Cody Gibson all partnered on this Facebook group called Next Level Agents. It had a different name. I had to change the name because it was stupid, and I because I thought of it in like three seconds. It's very long. Um, yes, it was. And so now it's just called Next Level Agents. And so we're excited. We're about twenty two thousand, almost twenty three thousand members strong. Um, probably. I like there's really good engagement in there. Most of the topics are about becoming next level and most of the topics in there are there to help us grow. And, uh, you know, it's anytime you get 23,000 people together, not everything's going to be high level. Um, and I think we do a pretty damn good job of monitoring that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have got a, our first live event coming up on May 18th in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, called next level agents live. And we have got like, our goal was to just put together the best one day event in the real estate industry not company specific. So we have got Jason Abrams coming to speak. We've got my good, my dear friend, Chelsea Pites, who is like a social media freaking genius. Like, trust me, she is the yeah, one. Yeah, she's amazing. Social media when it comes to real estate. Uh, she will be speaking. Travis Tom, who is a who is so good at Facebook ads in the real estate world, Facebook sought him out uh, to get advice from him on real estate and their platforms and what they're working on. Uh, so Travis, who who runs his agency, will be there to talk about uh, uh, Facebook ads. John Cheplak, who is the authority, in my opinion, when it comes to recruiting and leadership in our in our space, uh, will be there speaking. Dustin Runyon, who not enough people know, but is quite literally my favorite speaker on the planet. He also happens to be a good friend of mine. He'll be speaking. Via Williams uh, from Pacific Northwest in Seattle, who runs the Via Group, will be there. She kicks ass. Yes, um, she does. In, uh, Veronica Figueroa, who is with Remax, uh, one of the top Remax agents in the country, 2017 Inman Innovator of the Year is speaking. Like we've got, in my opinion, like the lineup of lineups, and um, like I'm just I'm so excited for it. So we're doing that. It's a one day event. If you're interested in information on that, you could go to nlalive.com. NLA stands for Next Level Agents. nlalive.com, or you could request to join the group, and and one of the admins will will add you. Um, and so that's kind of, that's that. That's awesome. And guys, their group really is amazing. The level of conversation, um, that happens in there is insane. Uh, Kevin also will meet with other individuals like this and have them talk about whatever their expertise is. So you just get constant knowledge dropped on you by him, Fred, Cody, Jason's in there a lot. Brian's in there a lot or anyone else that they bring in. Joshua Smith was, was one that you recently did something on. Like it's, it's just really great. Well-rounded. Um, besides those two groups, where can people reach you if they need to Facebook, awesome. Snapchat, anything? <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, by the way, so Joshua Smith will also be at, at speaking at next level agents live as well. Um, so the best way to get on, honestly, I think I'm, I feel like I'm most active on Instagram these days just because mm -hmm. I like it. I like, I really like that platform. Um, so that's just Kevin underscore Kaufman. Um, you can find me on Snapchat. That's mostly just pictures of my kids and with crazy filters or of me doing stupid things like using a closed steamer to open up the pores on my nose so I can use my niece's uh, pore cleaner. Um, <laughs> So Snapchat's a lot of fun, but understand I'm really goofy. Like Snapchat and Twitter, I use basically just to goof off. And then Facebook, um, you can. I've got a business page, which is the best way to connect with me, uh, or in the Facebook group, Next Level Agents. Like that's really where I'm most active uh, mm -hmm. is inside the Facebook group, Next Level Agents, or my Facebook page, uh, which is just KevinKaufman.co, I think, because .com wasn't available. I don't know. And then. <laughs> And then Instagram, which is Kevin underscore Kaufman. So follow me there. And awesome. uh, don't, as I always like to say, don't follow me, engage me. I don't like followers. I like, I like to engage with people. <laughs> uh, and that's why I love social media. And so that's, that's the easiest way to connect with me. I love that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kevin, for being on. For everyone who's watching, we're going to throw the link to the Next Level uh, Agents group in the comments so that y'all can easily access that. And awesome. then we'll, we'll probably put a link there for your event, too, so that they can quickly access that. Guys, the lineup is badass. He's a badass. Uh, we appreciate you watching. Thanks for being on.
Thanks for having me today. Super enjoyed it. Uh, have a, have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye.